welcome to this lecture on Parkinson's disease. I'm Carlos Singer, a professor of neurology uh, in uh, the Miller School of Medicine, University of Miami. I want to thank uh, the organizers of the course, particularly Dr. Eduardo Locatelli and Dr. Victor Velez for having so kindly invited me to give this lecture. They had requested that I concentrate a bit uh, on the biology of Parkinson's disease. And I, I tried to do that and added some additional clinical and therapeutic considerations uh, at the beginning and at the end of the lecture. So I hope you enjoy it. So we're going to cover uh, clinical phenotypes uh, of the different forms of presentation of Parkinson, the non-motor manifestations of it. And then we will uh, dive into what we could call the pathology of motor Parkinson's disease, certain particularities of its progression, particularities of how it propagates, considerations of etiology, and possible future treatment avenues. So let's go over the clinical features. On the uh, left, you see one of the most frequently uh, shown illustrations, sometimes the actual photograph of uh, an individual with Parkinson's disease. This appeared in 1886 in the treatise on uh, diseases of uh, the nervous system by Sir William Gowers. It's the most frequently shown. And as pointed out by the authors of the article, Time for a New Image of Parkinson's Disease in German Neurology, it runs the risk of uh, stereotyping. So it may not do full credit, if you will, to the complexities, the, the clinical complexities of the disease, the fact that it can affect women, uh, just like it affects men, perhaps a little bit less, 60% male. Uh, it can affect different ethnic groups. And it has a variety of uh, progressions that are not really embodied in that illustration. So we, are, we see Parkinson's disease as defined by its motor features and there is a triad. And the main actor in the triad is bradykinesia. That's the main one. And we say it, it, it should combine with either rigidity or tremor. You don't need all three, but you need bradykinesia and rigidity or bradykinesia and tremor to call something Parkinson's disease. Now tremor is only present in 80%, not present in 100%. So uh, there are cases that don't have tremor. You have also, as the disease progresses, there's shuffling gait, there's postural instability, there is freezing of gait. And we have other features that we recognize. They're not present in all patients, but uh, you can have mass facies and stoop posture, and among other things. Uh, there is a one presentation which uh, uh, the authors had called mild motor predominant. And what they try to show is somebody is in their 50s, 60s, or even younger, they have a few non-motor symptoms, they are have slow progression, and they have a good, very good response to medications to the point that they may appear normal, except for tremor, maybe some mild decrease in facial expression or foot dystonia. You may also deal with a, what they have called the intermediate type. There are more prominent motor symptoms. There is modest to very good response to medications. Some are still able to work. They may even look normal or dyskinetic when they're on, slow, rigid, tremulous when off. And they have very slow progression for years before they become disabled. Finally, there is an advanced version of the disease. Now, the, it may occur after many years of the part of what we have described so far, or there, it may be a rapidly progressive phenotype of late life. And in either case, there's severe motor and unmotor features, 
rigidity, stoop posture, short steps, freezing, as I said, may or may not have tremor. One may notice more of a cognitive side to the problem and using, uh, uh, they're using assistive devices. In addition to the maladies caused by the motor problems, uh, the patients have to deal not only with that, with the comorbidities that come with age, uh, cerebrovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, and so on. And you see the non-motor symptoms, it's quite a burden on these patients and it accrues over years. So you will have a cognitive burden. You'll have anywhere between frontal lobe dysfunction to mild cognitive impairment all the way to dementia. You will have neuropsychiatric problems, that include anxiety, depression, apathy, and uh, certainly um, Parkinson's disease psychosis with delusion and hallucinations, which is the price our patients pay for many years of dopaminergic treatment. There are problems with sleep. There is insomnia, sleep fragmentation, excessive diurnal somnolence. There is REM behavior disorder, which actually can precede the motor symptoms of Parkinson for years. You have impulse control disorder as a result of exposure to dopamine agonists, particularly, although not only dopamine agonists, even levodopa can be associated with impulse control disorder. And uh, you may have it in up to 20% of cases, depending on the population. Sensory problems, anosmia, for example, is a very well-known uh, uh, symptom that is present sometimes for years <clears throat> before the motor manifestations. But there are also problems with pain. For example, we think that pain, the back pain caused by lumbar, lumbar stenosis, by spinal stenosis, can be magnified by having Parkinson's disease. There are, there are urinary symptoms. Uh, for example, uh, urinary frequency is very, very commonly seen uh, with urgent, urgency and urgent continence. You can have gastrointestinal symptoms, constipation, for example, being something that you see for years before Parkinson. All of these are maladies and a burden that adds to the difficulties of Parkinson's disease over the years. So what about the underlying pathology? This is a slide that shows a normal uh, substantial nigra. This is a light microscopy. And you, what you see are neurons uh, that, of the substantial nigra, which have this pigment, neuromelanin. And neuromelanin in substantial nigra is nothing else but polymer of dopamine. You get, if you do a similar stain and a similar slide of the locus ceruleus, where you have uh, cells that are producing noradrenaline, this norepinephrine cell will also have neuromelanin, which will be a polymer of norepinephrine. And, and we see locus ceruleus is involved in Parkinson's, so we're, we're going to talk about that. So if you look at the pathology of Parkinson's disease, uh, uh, what do we see? What is the underlying abnormality in this? Uh, as we all know, the, the, the center for the motor Parkinson is a substantial nigger. Well, in a control brain, it's, uh, you see um, normal pigmentation. When it comes to a Parkinson brain, you see marked depigmentation. When you go into light microscopy, you have a normal amount of pigmented neurons in the normal control. When you go to the patient with Parkinson, there is a marked loss of those pigmented neurons. Something has happened. Right? When you look into the substantia nigra with higher magnification, you find these bodies called the Lewy bodies, their inclusion bodies, in the surviving neurons. What is this? If you do special staining, you discover that a great greater part of that uh, Lewy body is uh, contains aggregation of alpha synuclein. That's, the, that's a protein that will be a repeat, repeated theme in this lecture. So 
how does Parkinson's disease progress? What do we know of it pathologically? This is a slide that is very well known for us in the Parkinson and movement disorder field. It was published by it, an, in, in an article by uh, Hiko Brack, a, a German pathologist, in Neurobiology of Aging 2003. This is a very famous figure. And what it proposes, and this is, uh, he worked on about, I believe, 417 brains that he had obtained from a brain bank in the United States, in Arizona, from, from people who had donated a brain, people who lived in retired uh, retirees in residential communities of uh, Phoenix. So after his studies, he concluded, he and he, he promoted a hypothesis that is still viewed as an important launching pad for our understanding of the disease, is that the same synuclein aggregates that we just saw, the ones that are existent within the neurons of the substantial nigra, appear first in other areas of the central nervous system and gradually find their way to the midbrain and beyond. And they follow a certain order. So he's finding synuclein aggregates in an, appearing in certain areas and then appearing in additional areas. Where he finds them first is in two areas, and he calls this the stage one. And now it's known as the stage one of Brock's hypothesis of Brock's staging system, the olfactory bulb, I'm sorry, and the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. Now that innervates the colon. So you now have an understanding of why it would be that for years before developing motor Parkinson's disease, people would have a, a nosmia and constipation. Not necessarily everybody, but many. Where those, but let's continue seeing what happens here, this area, because for a while things don't move much more from the olfactory ball. They will come later, but they're still there. They're not here there. So when we go here, we go into the locus ceruleus and the dorsal raphae nuclei. So now there's involvement of those, that's stage two. So here you have potential uh, explanations, for example, for REM behavior disorder in the way that locus cereolus and adjacent nuclei are affected. In depression preceding Parkinson's disease by the uh, involvement of the dorsal raphae nuclei. That's stage two of BRAC staging system. Stage three, how we are. We finally reach the midbrain and we have motor Parkinson's, motor manifestations of Parkinson's disease, which have been already pre-motor, have had already pre-motor manifestations. And now we have the motor manifestations. State in stage four, we finally start invading the cortex. First, we go into the mesocortex and it was the hippocampus and amygdala. We, and we have kind of a substrate for what's happening to the memory mechanisms, what's happening to anxiety. Finally, gradually, it encompasses a number of regions in the uh, neocortex, and that's what we call stages five and six of uh, Brock's staging system. That's it for the propagation, for the, uh, for the uh, uh, progression of the disease. We also uh, have to remember that there is not only Parkinson's disease, there is Lewy body dementia, for example. That may follow a different pattern. And it is possible that in those cases, the disease does start in olfactory bulb, just like it does with uh, Parkinson's disease, but it finds its way, it goes directly to the limbic system that we already mentioned, mesocortical. It, some of it may go through the brainstem. Eventually, both Parkinson and Lewy body dementia converge in involvement of both brainstem and limbic system, and we will have eventually involvement of the neocortex. This is in an attempt to be more inclusive of synucleonopathies other than Parkinson's disease, or at least of Lewy body dementia. 
So what, what about uh, the ideologies that have a role in getting this whole process started? Well, there is genetics. And in genetics, uh, we have a number of uh, diseases that are familiar. Only 10% of Parkinson's disease is truly purely, we can almost call it purely genetic or very much genetically determined. These, there are, I've, I'm here listing three of the autosomal dominant that are best known, but they're not the only ones, and three of the autosomal recessive that are better known, but they're not the only ones. And we also have the, the genetic risk factor. So you can have a, what we call the LARC2 uh, autosomal dominant, but it does not have full penetrance. You have the same gene that went in its heterozygous, in its homozygous uh, form, causes Gaucher's disease, but you need two alleles, it's autosomal recessive. But if you inherit only one defective GBA gene of the Gaucher gene, but only one defective, you will not develop Gaucher's, but you will, you are at increased risk for Parkinson's disease. And then there is a very famous uh, mutation. This is the one that opened the field, which is the families that had a mutation of the alpha synuclein uh, protein. And um, those are much rarer, but they actually were the ones that opened the field to alpha synuclein, understanding of the role of alpha synuclein. Among the autosomal recessive, we have Parkin, which is in young onset Parkinson disease. All of them, pink one, DJ1 Parkin, you have to suspect them when you deal with a young person, a autosomal recessive, that means you need two defective genes. They may appear as a surprise in a family. You never expect it because each parent was carrying it in a silent way. And then you get the, uh, uh, the offspring. One of them inherits both uh, defective genes. You have uh, Parkinson disease and a, young, and a young person without a family history, really. And then you have genetic risk factors. <laughs> so they, up to 2017, there were 26 genetic risk factors. That means that if you have any number of these variants and potentially any interaction with a certain environmental uh, agent, you could have Parkinson's disease. So 26 of these gene 20 genetic variants were known in 17. I think there were about 70 in 2019. So talking about the environment, we have pesticide exposure, farm work, rural residents. All of that has been defined as uh, potential uh, risk factors. You have chlorinated solvents, particularly trichloroethylene. And these solvents are used in a variety of industries in dry cleaning, degreasing, uh, textile manufacture, in coolants, in lubricants. And of course you need the, having the, let's say the wrong gene makeup that is exposed to this for it to cause Parkinson. In welders, uh, perhaps as a result of exposure to manganese fumes. There are even studies of air pollution proposing it as a risk factor. And interestingly, head trauma. And head trauma, uh, the more head trauma, the more the risk. But there are certain people that have a certain variant of alpha synuclein that may make them prone to develop Parkinson disease if they suffer uh, one or more head traumas. So what is happening inside the neurons of the affected nuclei? or region, so in the substantia nigra, but also in the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. What is happening in there? Well, what happens, you have on the left-hand side here, a number of toxins or pathogens that uh, brings to mind the post uh, cases of uh, uh, Parkinsonism that is post-encephalitic metals, like we mentioned, uh, manganese. You have here other rotenone, which is uh, also a pesticide, you have the process of aging, always. Aging is always present uh, as a risk factor for Parkinson. And you have here the mutations we spoke about. Up here, you have the recessive ones. And in here, 
you have the dominant ones. And uh, what is happening here? Well, you have an interaction where you have oxidative stress. So these factors, or be they toxins or uh, uh, mutations, will bring about a situation of increased oxidative stress and or mitochondrial dysfunction, all of which will result in increased aggregation of synuclein. So synuclein is in increased in expression, it's misfolded and it aggregates. And when it is in, that, in this form in and, in and of itself, it also generates further oxidative stress. So it acts as a toxic uh, agent, if you will, inside the neuron. So you have here head injury, the toxins we mentioned, the metals causing oxidative stress. You have also DJ1 mutation, the recessive, because it is, uh, when it's present pathogenically, it, a pathogenic mutation uh, is a strike against good oxidative stress mechanisms. You have Parkin mutation, pink one mutation, which uh, act direct, uh, there, once there is a mutation that is uh, bad news for mitochondrial function, particularly mitogenesis and mitophagy. And you have an accumulation of dysfunctional mitochondria. You, uh, rotenone can also cause mitochondrial stress. In the case of the mutation we mentioned of alpha synuclein, what you have is a production of a, a mutated synuclein that uh, misfolds and aggregates. And in the case of the autosomal dominant uh, mutations, you have defective clearance of the, the alpha synuclein. Just as an example of uh, gene environment interaction, there has been a recent report in movement disorders where, where they described that the use of anti-inflammatory drugs decreased the penetrance of the, those who have the LARC2 mutation. So how does the disease propagate? Well, the idea is that you have for all of the factors we described, an increase in alpha-synuclein aggregation. That aggregation, that misfolded and aggregated synuclein transmits its message directly to another cell in what's called cell-to-cell -cell transfer. In other words, misfolded and aggregated alpha-synuclein would act as a prion. And what you, what you start thinking of is here you have a vulnerable neuron. The neuron is rendered vulnerable by the toxins or the pathogenic mutations or their interaction. It increases its expression of alpha-synuclein. It also receives a misfolding, misfolded alpha-synuclein message from another cell. Either way, there is alpha-synuclein aggregation, Lewy body pathology, further changes of neurodegeneration, always contributed by a number of other things that are happening inside the neuron, uh, such as increased calcium influx into the cytosol, mitochondrial, dysfunction, lysosomal dysfunction, all of the things that we mentioned. And this message being transmitted from cell to cell via prion mechanism of seeding of the protein by, by, an, by the misfolded alpha synuclein. So what does this result as far, what does it mean for future treatments? Some of them are already ongoing. Well, you, you can think of ways in which you would decrease the alpha-synuclein production. You could think of ways of decreasing the alpha-synuclein aggregation inside the neuron or increasing its degradation or decreasing 
the extracellular alpha-synuclein or decreasing the alpha-synuclear cellular uptake. You could also promote the activity of the glucoserebrosidase enzyme, and this is actually currently under study as a clinical trial, or in the case of the LARC2 uh, uh, genetic mutation, those who harbor this mutation, you could try to decrease the excess tyrosine kinase activity that, it's, uh, that is caused by the, this mutation. Conclusions. Parkinson disease displays a variety of modes of presentation and progression. It also includes multiple non-motor problems that add to the burden of the disease. The involvement of the substantia nigra is preceded and followed by a rostrocotally ascending process. This process affects specific brainstem nuclei and has a particular progression beyond the substantia nig nigra proceeding to mesocortical and later to neocortical regions. Synuclein, where, which is misfolded and aggregated, is the central molecular malfunction of the disease. It may propagate via prion mechanisms. Etiology is viewed as a result of a spectrum of environmental genetic interactions. Future treatments incorporate an understanding of these mechanisms. Thank you very much for your attention.